Hey, welcome to the web audience. I'm uh, Calvin Zito, HPE storage guy, and you are now welcome to the fireside chat. There's the fire. I'm not an artist, so I had Brad draw the picture. I'm not an artist either, as you can clearly tell. You're gonna need the microphone when you talk. <laughs> so, uh, we've had a lot of news. Our news for Discover actually went out a couple weeks ago. I don't know how many of you guys I, you know, I at least put it in the agenda for this session, links to the news. How many of you guys actually heard the news for storage and kind of have an idea what storage announced? Okay, so we'll still do a kind of just a quick flyby, um, and I'll have our speakers introduce themselves. There's a lot because storage is a, a lot of stuff. We, you know, there's a lot of uh, um, technology here, and one guy trying to do it all isn't, isn't going to work very well. So I've got a, a lot of people here, and I'll start by having folks that are possibly going to talk introduce themselves. And Neil, I know you're over there, but come on over and why don't you start by introducing yourself and tell I'll folks what you do. Okay. No. <laughs> okay, uh, my name's Neil Fleming. I run the worldwide product management team uh, for Store Once and Recovery Manager Central, which is a piece of software that provides copy data management services for our primary storage and secondary storage arrays. I want you to hand it to Hey guys, Brett Gibbs, I'm the Persistent Memory Product Manager, and uh, get a chance today, I'll talk to you about our new announcement of our tele terabyte scale persistent memory. Brad Parks, Director of Product and Solutions for the storage business. Um, I'm just here because Calvin wanted to make me feel good, so. Hello everyone, uh, it's Patrick Osborne, Director of Product Management uh, at HPE Storage. Um, thanks for having me. Hi everyone, um, Gavin Cohen, also product and solutions, but from the Nimble Storage part of Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Aravindan, Aravindan Gopalakrishnan, and I manage the Tripa uh, product management team. Glad to be here. I'm Phil Gilbert, I sit in uh, the product management team for Tripa, and Aravindan is my boss, so I have to be very careful about what I say. Oh, is that better? Yes. Um, okay. Um, the uh, yeah. Um, um, and I'm responsible for all the flash technology sitting inside uh, 3PA. So we're going to start with Brad just kind of giving an overview of the announcement. And then I'm going to have Brad and Gavin give their perspective about the HPE and Nimble Storage coming together. And then we'll kind of open it up to your questions at that point. So. All right. So, um, so yeah, it was a, it's a big announcement. Whenever we do Discover, the engineering teams, I think, line up just to make it hard for, uh, for us to crank it all through the machine. Uh, we've got two big buckets. On the primary storage side of the house, we did almost a complete portfolio update from uh, entry on the MSA, so a new MSA 2000 series, uh, brought Nimble into the fold, uh, which has been an exciting ride and just, I think, we went six weeks from due diligence to acquisition, and then acquisition to a new product introduction was a pretty frenetic pace. Uh, and then a three-part 9450, which AG can go into depth on, really brought the uh, mid-range of the three-part three -part portfolio up a notch, uh, a lot more performance, a lot more density, so a very big update on the three-part product line. And then not to be left out, memory is not just uh, a conversation for external storage about moving persistent memory uh, up to terabyte scale and compute. So from a primary storage side, we, uh, we did a big update. Um, one of the things we're seeing you know, in market as we're talking to customers, when you're running at that performance envelope doing data protection you know, in a traditional way at scale and at that speed just doesn't work. So we've spent a lot of time with RMC, some of the other technologies kind of shrinking that window, collapsing the stack. And so we did some updates to Recovery Manager Central, Neil's product line, um, and one of the very cool ones is Store Once Cloud Bank. So we, you know, talk about hybrid IT. It's easy to hand wave around hybrid IT and then shove a bunch of on-prem gear at somebody. But actually, in real hybrid IT, uh, Cloud Bank is very cool. So an object, off-prem object here for backup data. Um, a lot of cool technology that went into that. And then on the Nimble side, uh, one of the use cases we've seen with customers who've kind of mainstreamed Flash is seeing what other workloads can they tap into. And so we have a lot of customers running Nimble on the all Flash and the hybrid Flash uh, sweet spot who talk to the Nimble team about getting more value out of that array, particularly secondary arrays where they might be 
replicating data to or backing up data to. So the secondary flash array is a, a unique intersection of being a backup target, but for customers who also want to expose that snapshot data and use it to address you know, secondary workloads like QA, test, analytics, so um, a lot around secondary. So those are the two big, kind of big buckets. It was a good chance at Discover. We've had a lot of change in the business in the last year between you know, SimpliVity, Nimble, three-part continuing to grow, so it's a big opportunity for us to kind of roll out the new product line, talk to a lot of customers, and answer any questions you guys have. So, where'd our MC go? You want the Gavin and Brad show, is that? Yeah, I want the Gavin and Brad show. So maybe we'll start with Gavin. Again, Gavin uh, is a VP at Nimble Storage, integrating into the team. I've talked to him more times than I can tell you with the stuff I've been doing. And I wanted you to kind of just talk about, you know, your perspective on Nimble Storage coming in to be part of HPE. Yeah, absolutely. And um, is this loud enough seeing into the microphone? <laughs> so it's been an absolute whirlwind for any of the Nimble storage employees. And you guys should have a look at our booth. There are quite a few of us here. And we're the ones with the big, um, I think Bill Philbin called it the big green obelisk standing out that doesn't probably yet comply with HPE branding. But it's been an absolutely fabulous experience because I've got to tell you, as a Nimble employee, and coming from a startup company that's been highly successful and grown at an unbelievable pace, we got to more than 10,000 customers at um, you know as an independent company prior to the acquisition. I think there were clearly some worries about what happens when you get acquired by a big company, and you know what what, what does this really mean for Nimble Storage and the Nimble unique culture and the products and in particular and we heard this really loudly from our customers you know is this going to screw up our support that we've really come to know and as an industry leader in how we support our customers driven through our predictive analytics and what i can say is all of those thoughts have proved to be completely incorrect in how this acquisition has been executed so if you start with my comments on support the way that we're organizing it is the exact same Nimble support team, the same, every single one of the employees that worked in our InfoSci predictive analytics and support team, instead of being folded into the HP support organization, they're very much being firewalled and they're put inside the same engineering team that they've always been in inside the storage BU. So what that lets us do is run support autonomously but even better, take all of the sort of goodness that Nimble's been able to achieve with support and predictive analytics and look at ways of expanding that across other products like 3 par would be the, the natural first one of those. So we've really managed to preserve that and I think that's sort of a big sigh of relief from our customers. On the culture side, what's been interesting is as much as HPE is a massive company, within HPE, storage is run very much like a startup mentality. And in fact, there's a lot of shared heritage where the, the leader of the storage BU, Bill Philbin, has a heritage from NetApp. So do most of the founders of, of Nimble. Um, I'm not a founder, but I spent six years at NetApp before joining Nimble. So we've got this very similar kind of culture and testament to it is what Brad said that in less than really four weeks between the acquisition closing on April 17th and um, the you know middle of May when we announced the availability of Nimble Storage products through the HP channel and we launched our secondary flash array, the amount that we've managed to get done in four weeks um, has been absolutely astounding. So it's been a fantastic experience and I think what it really brings to Nimble is and, and what we're seeing having come from the startup is it's very hard to grow at scale as a startup company. And there was an interesting stat thrown out yesterday of all the many hundred storage startups that have ever been in existence, only one of them has managed to grow to a billion dollars and beyond as an independent company, and that's NetApp. Every other successful storage startup has been acquired to continue to scale. And if you look at Data Domain, 3 pars a fantastic example, Isilon, many others, they've gotten to a very significant growth point on their own, but to then really accelerate that growth, they've been acquired. And we absolutely expect to do that under HPE, 
just with the access to this massive machinery and global channel that it, it brings us into. So yeah, a lot of excitement on the Nimble side. Yeah, I think one of the other things that uh, has come up in some of the discussions in looking and unpacking the IP under the hood uh, at Nimble, a lot of the work they were already doing in the hopper around predictive analytics across the full stack, right? getting data from not just storage, but up through the network, compute node, hypervisors up into the app, thinking about things like hyperconverge, software defined. There are a lot of things that they were looking at already as an independent company that being part of HP, we've got a lot more resources now to bring to bear if you think about the compute footprint we have, the networking, the relationships we have on the alliance side. So a lot of the, the telemetry data, the deep learning, the analytics that they brought to bear on storage as a storage pure play, we now have you know tenfold that many data points we can probably suck into that big data repository and do some very cool things with, as well as changing that support model on the three par, SimpliVity, and some of the other sides to, uh, to really take advantage of what Nimble's grown and, and Nimble customers really love about that platform. So. Do you want to do questions yeah. kind of along the way versus, and then certainly on, on any of this stuff as we go through, Calvin helped run the show, but we got the smart guys here. I'll get out of the way. Questions. you get a uh, VIP wristband to get into the Veeam HPE storage nimble party tonight. I thought I was going to get Congratulations. One of those. Thank you. I thought I was going to get one of those anyway by being a Vanguard, but <laughs> right, Tim? I'm going to give that back. No, lost. From that point of view, though, as a Veeam Vanguard, we actually had some discussions two weeks ago in um, what? Veeam? No in New Orleans about store once in conjunction with Veeam that one of the biggest limitations that we have is the file chain limitations. Okay, so with some of the competing dedupe products, we've got the ability to have 50 files open at once for a restore chain, and on the smaller store once, you get seven, mid-range you get 14, larger ones you get maybe 21. In other words, unless you're deploying a really big one, you have huge limitations when working with it as a secondary in products like Veeam that like to have multi-chain open. When are you guys going to get past that defect is probably the best way of asking. So that limitation only exists on NAS. Um, last year, Veeam announced integration with Catalyst on store once, those limitations don't exist so much We're on store. We're seeing them in production today. With Catalyst? With Catalyst. Okay, so there are um, there are limits in Catalyst about number of simultaneous readers. There has been a Catalyst update that Veeam is adopting that allows uh, more simultaneous readers. So it's not, it's not a file open limit. The file open limit only exists on NAS. It's um, the number of uh, reading streams that you can implement in Catalyst. That that issue doesn't exist in the Catalyst build that we have, but Veeam has to adopt the new Catalyst client, and they've they've said that they're going to do that in Veeam 10. So um, that uh, implementation also removes the limitation on supporting the Veeam Cloud Connect because it's the Veeam Cloud Connect has the same issue. That was one of the other ones that was going to follow. So yeah. thank you. <laughs> okay, so with Veeam Cloud Connect, because they open um, all the uh, the uh, the previous backups at the same time to do the the cloud sync, you you hit the same limitation. So um, as I said, that's solved with the same fix. Okay, so we've we've done our side of the code. We've passed that code to Veeam. It just needs to be built into a Veeam build, which is looking like ten. Excellent. It's it's one of my favorite dedupe appliances out there. So having those limitations eliminated, that's good. I'm surprised you haven't asked about Catalyst Copy though. I asked about Catalyst Copy during an NDA session with Veeam, and I can't go anywhere with that conversation. Okay. So. Good. Okay. But you can answer from your perspective. Um, so from our perspective, uh, Veeam asked us to make some changes to the way Catalyst Copy worked. Um, we've made those changes and passed that code to um, 
Veeam, so my answer would be very similar to the number of simultaneous readers question, which is the code has been passed to Veeam. It needs to be built into a Veeam release. Um, they, they have told us it will be sometime between 10 and 10.5. They haven't committed to which release it's going to be in, um, but they are working on it. I don't know if that matches what you were told in the NDA, though. <laughs> and hey, Neil, for people that are watching that maybe aren't as deep as others, and maybe even folks here, that what, yeah. what is Catalyst and what is Catalyst Copy? So Catalyst is, first of all, it's an object repository on Store One, so you don't have the same limitations on um, file size, file structure, directory structure, etc., that you experience with a NAS implementation. Um, but beyond that, it allows a Catalyst supporting backup application like Veeam or Net Backup or Data Protector to use our deduplication algorithm at source. So by deduplicating the data at source, you move much less data across the network, therefore it's much more efficient, much faster. Um, another side of Catalyst is Catalyst Copy, which is where the backup ISV gains control of the replication functionality in the array and so can offload that replication. Today, Veeam doesn't support Catalyst Copy, so any replication has to go back through the Veeam server, which is less efficient. Um, the other Catalyst imp implementations with the likes of Net Backup, Data Protector, etc., do support Catalyst Copy. So once the data is deduplicated, those can just uh, trigger an API at a scheduled interval to replicate the data to another store once appliance. Okay. Good. Thanks. Questions? Richard, you don't fail me. A question about the storage portfolio. Um, it's, it's fairly large portfolio now, and I think there's definitely some elements of overlap. Um, at the moment, we've seen that all the products that have been brought into the portfolio continue to be sold as separate products. What does the future hold for further integration? First question. Um, and secondly, how would you cope with if integration is the future, where different companies have taken different routes, for example, Nimble being an active-passive array versus FreePAR being an um, active-active? So if, if I can maybe just from a, a Nimble perspective talk about some of the very obvious integration points um, both ways. I think one of the key drivers of the acquisition of Nimble is what we've done with InfoSight, with our predictive analytics platform. And I assume there's familiarity, but essentially we collect millions of sensor data points from each environment spanning from storage up to the hypervisor. And we correlate and perform all kinds of machine learning techniques in real time with the idea of predicting and preventing problems. So one of the backwards integration points where there'll be some nimble technology brought across other HP storage portfolio products will be taking that InfoSight IP and leveraging those predictive analytics where we can pull sensors from three power arrays or SimpliVity or whichever of the products and try and perform some of those similar kinds of functionality to make them you know, more autonomous, more reliable, help the support process. I think that's a, a very stated direction of, of overlap or of um, integration. The other one is when we look as nimble, things like RMC, Recovery Manager Central, where it's just got such a richness of, um, you know, ecosystem support and the ability to, you know, add to what we've been able to do natively, I think it's a natural one. I think some of the management integration with OneView is, is a very natural integration point. Um, maybe to your point about the underlying architectures, I think each product has strengths in how it's been architected. And I don't know that it makes sense. I mean, from our experience as Nimble, customers don't buy or not buy Nimble because of our active, um, you know, active standby architecture. They look at the end result which says, we can seamlessly fail over between controllers. We can run 100% of load on one controller and fail over guaranteed performance. So I think more and more customers are much more interested in the, the end result than in you know, how it's done under the covers. So I think trying to integrate that and make it normalized probably doesn't make sense from an integration point. But I'm curious if anyone else wants to, to comment. 
I mean, that's a that's a great perspective there, uh, uh, Gavin. So from a, I think first thing is to say the, syn the actual synergies to, uh, to to an overused word, but uh, is um, there's a lot of good stuff there that especially from that predictive analyst perspective, which can immediately be applied to uh, a portfolio platform like per three par, uh, most definitely. Now, uh, and uh, there is a uh, the architecture and the way the way these products work. Uh, that are definite, uh, uh, you know, market segments and, and, and users for, for which the, each of these products will make sense, of course. From an architectural perspective, you're right. I think it's, uh, uh, it's, it's it, like, I think the, there are strengths and weaknesses uh, if you look at it from an architectural perspective. Um, you know, a, a, a multi-node scale-out active architecture like 3PAR has its, its benefits, you know, big bandwidth, for example, uh, or, or uh, or you know, just out and out performance, right? Um, so there are places where that will still make a lot of sense. Um, so in, in one way, it's, it's a way of u using Flash more effectively, if you think about it, right? So you know, that, that still remains. But we will certainly look at leveraging the good things um, as much as we can between these portfolios. Um, um, and simplicity is another strength that, uh, that Nimble has. It's a, very, it's a great thing as well that we look to leverage down the road. Yeah, so when I take a look at the uh, at the portfolio, uh, Gavin alluded to it a little bit. Um, I think there's a lot of things that, as a portfolio company, we can bring to bear to accelerate uh, nimble. And there's a, a lot of it is around secondary storage. So we started a relationship with Veeam um, about a year ago, and uh, we, you know, in fact, we resell them. For example, as part of the HPE Complete program, uh, I'd say you know northwards of how many, 25 percent of your uh, customers, you know, influence or yeah, a significant amount of Nimble customers use Veeam, right? So um, there's further integration opportunities we have there. Um, this whole idea of federating primary and secondary storage. Um, so, for example, being able to extend the same capabilities we do with three par and store once with RMC um, out to to Nimble is, uh, I mean, that's basically a slam dunk. From an engineering perspective, it's not very hard to do. Other things that, that customers are asking us for, um, uh, I think it, to, to reflect what people want from the, from the product is, we've had a number of customers ask for um, what we do is uh, we have a feature called peer copy, right? It's able to replicate between disparate array architectures. You know, so for example, being able to replicate between Nimble and 3PAR in the future has been something that they've, you know, things that they've asked us for. Um, other areas of um, integration with Synergy, right? So if you take a look at a converged infrastructure stack that puts together Synergy, OneView, our networking assets, um, as well as, uh, you know, primary storage that could be either 3PAR or Nimble is certainly things that customers have asked us for. So, I mean, there is some uh, obvious overlap in the portfolio uh, that we'll have to manage with our customers and partners. But at the end of the day, I think there's a ton of stuff that we can use, um, you know, from an integration standpoint. There's, there's not a lot of overlap, um, you know, in those other areas. Hey, Phil Sellers has a question. So one thing I don't see on the board is SimpliVity. And I also see Store Virtual missing. So a couple questions around that. From your software-defined storage strategy, where is that going for existing customers who bought into Store Virtual and to the hyperconverged 380? Is there going to be a migration path? What sorts of things can we expect in the future there? Yeah, so um, so a couple a couple of things in there. It's not up on the board because we didn't have any major announcements around uh, Store Virtual. Uh, but not just necessarily on the board. There, yeah, you know. there's, there's a whole strategy slide that's going around at the show that's missing from it also. Yep. So for us, that was a, sort of a clear um, positioning ex exercise around exter external disk arrays, right? Um, and we get a lot of questions from the field, right, because of SimpliVity in, in, in the acquisition in terms of there's a lot of different workloads um, that at the end of the day end up on, you know, a virtualized platform. And whether you're going to do it with HCI or you're going to do that with external disk depends on a number of factors, right? Um, you know, a whole thing around scaling you know independent of uh, CPU and memory and storage and a number of different factors and simplicity um, but from from our perspective there's a couple things that are going on uh, simplicity is definitely our lead with offering around hyperconverged absolutely there's no doubt about that and there's going to be uh, an upgrade path 
for customers that are on HC380 and HC250, you know, to get to those platforms that are on SimpliVity. Um, and that's uh, something that we can bring in Baroth or someone from the, the SimpliVity team to talk to specifically about, you know, how they're going to enable that. Um, from a store virtual perspective, we actually just released a, um, a new version of store virtual VSA 12.7. Um, that's available out in the in the market today. Um, for from from our perspective, for a software defined um, play, you know, we we made a big investment in SimpliVity, right? Um, that we're trying to you know get that out in the market uh, as you know our H, uh, as our hyper converged offering. Store Virtual is still available, you know, today for customers that choose to go for a software only route. Um, you know, what the future holds for that, um, you know, we're still taking a look at. You know how that fits within the platform, but for customers that are doing virtualized workloads that want to go down an HCI path, it's I mean, for us we're super laser focused on SimpliVity and porting those to as many server platforms um, as you know we get demand for. And currently, it's on the the DL three eighty and the Pro Line series. Um, you know, we're obviously taking a look at other form factors like Synergy and, and Apollo. You know, moving forward. Um, so that you know, SimpliVity is definitely we, we. It's on that positioning slide essentially because we get a lot of questions, right? So from a data services standpoint, are there things that you're interested to bring to other pieces of the HP storage portfolio? Um, yeah. So I think if you take a look at uh, a lot of our midsize and certainly enterprise customers are. We, we talked to some customers today and yesterday that they have MSA, they have 3PAR, and they have Nimble, and they have SimpliVity, right? All in the same data center addressing different workloads. Um, so anything we can do to drive together some of the data services across those um, is certainly a win for the customers in terms of workload portability uh, and being able to you know, use the right infrastructure for those applications that, you know, that need that type of um, uh, either an HCI implementation or external storage for whatever you're looking for. Um, I think the the certainly the the data services that we're going to put together between certainly three par and nimble uh, RMC is a is an is an easy you know first step for that. SimpliVity has a little bit of a different architecture at the back end because it's a you know essentially it's a purpose built scale out file system. But I think there's some things that we're taking a look at here as we see Vvol's you know adoption um, getting. Uh, uh, we're seeing it on Nimble and on 3PAR, um, where you're taking a look at a very VM-centric you know, way that you're, um, you're managing storage. So whether that translates to file or block, it's you know, getting down to the VM layer and um, trying to be able to sit, uh, share some data services between SimpliVity and certainly some of our storage. Uh, it's, I mean, that's something we're looking, looking at right now, absolutely. Hi, um, when I take a look at the board, um, I'm based in EMEA, I have a lot of customers with two server rooms and they want synchronous replication. Now I only see one product delivering me synchronous replication being TripR. What's next? I, I can say from a nimble perspective, it's something that we've we've blogged about, and actually at CBIT, um, I guess a month or so ago, um, we actually demoed synchronous rep on on Nimble Storage. We haven't said a release date for it, but it's absolutely on the cards for Nimble Storage. Yeah, it's a it's a big request request from your product management team. I think uh, Nimble right now gets you an, an RTO um, uh, RPO of uh, five minutes. Is, is, is where. One minute as right now, so you're getting pretty close. But for po folks that need, you know, those metro clusters, synchronous clusters, um, we can certainly achieve that with three par. But I know that's a big ask for for your customers as well, and you know, that's something we're we're marching towards. While we're on the subject of the synchronous and three par, we're going to see an active active two side instead of single owner for individual ones basically eliminating the hairpinning that happens when you're doing those metro clusters. That's roadmap, yeah, but uh, I don't have a date for it. Yeah, so we've, uh, it's something we're looking into, but uh, not on the immediate roadmap right now. So let's maybe talk a little bit about storage class memory. And I know there's, since you've got the mic, 
I mean, there's stuff that we've announced and talked about in the past with 3PAR, but some of these guys maybe haven't been there to hear it. And then and you get Brett involved and talk about the storage class memory side of uh, how we're working together between the server side and the storage side. So why don't you kind of give an overview what you're aware of what's going on with uh, 3PAR. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, and I actually, we have a session tomorrow um, on this topic uh, sure. broadly. Yeah, that's true. Uh, please, please attend that session. But what, uh, what's the session number? Six six six, right? Yeah. Oh. I kid you not. <laughs> it's called the anti-session. Um, so um, the 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 way to look at that is um, so we we have uh, because of Flash, uh, we really exposed a lot of uh, you know latency bottlenecks, um, and right now apps are starting to take look at what's coming next. So we have a problem essentially to solve. And uh, with HPE, we're trying to solve it in, on basically both sides of the spectrum. So the one place which is closest to the application is a server, compute, where we definitely have a big play. And there are certain ways in which you can actually accelerate apps there, eliminate bottlenecks there. That's where we have HPE persistent memory. Um, on the storage side, um, you know, the ex existing external storage devices, we are looking at persistent memory class devices, storage class memory devices, essentially, um, combined with NVMe as a way to accelerate dense storage systems. So, I mean, it's an interesting thing where, where we, we, we're looking at a, the, an IOPS per gigabyte problem slowly here, right? Bigger, bigger drives. And uh, we're coming to a point where we, we have facing the same problems of over provisioning uh, that with HDDs we had many, many years ago. So, this is the right time where you need this new technology coming in in the middle. And what we're doing is we, we previewed this in Discover last year at, um, at London. Uh, we actually integrated um, basically um, Optane, Intel Optane as a PCIe uh, device into this. Uh, um, the 9000 is a, is, a, is, a, is a system that will support that eventually. And it works as a caching layer uh, for an all-flash system. Um, so that, that's essentially the idea. The first step that we're taking with NVMe and storage class memory. Um, and the net, if this is, this is sort of the, the, you know, as you go along, we'll take bigger steps with that. But this is uh, step one right there. Brett, you want to talk about the process memory? Yeah, sure, Aravind. And um, first off, let me make a couple of comments here. Um, storage and memory are more than, you know, it's more than a cliche that they're merging. It's, it really is happening, right? So those of you familiar with our persistent memory category, in our uh, current generation nine ProLiant servers, we introduced the eight gig NVDIM. And I recognize some of you, I was in London talking about the eight gig NVDIM, right? Well, today publicly, I'm here to talk to you about the new terabyte scale persistent memory we call HPE scalable persistent memory. What we've done is we have a way of taking a portion of the DRAM inside the server, and we mark that as persistent memory. We have a layer of flash, right? And that flash is used for our uh, persistent store, because as you know, DRAM is volatile. And then we have a backup power source that facilitates the movement of data from DRAM into flash. So earlier, when I was talking about NVDIMs uh, in London, that's for small things, small storage bottlenecks. And what Aravindan and I are going to talk about tomorrow in our session are some of those intersection points, right? A good example is you're running your database on a three-par storage array. Um, one area that you typically have storage latency on the host, the server, are your transaction logs, right? So every transaction that happens in the database gets written to a transaction log. Perfect for NVDIMs. Scalable persistent memory, now you're going up to terabyte scale. Start thinking about the larger in-memory compute you can do with persistence. Writing to a layer of DRAM, nanosecond latency bus, as opposed to uh, some of the uh, slower storage options. Now, it's complementary. That's one of the uh, messages I want you to hear. And when I talk about memory and storage convergence, that's what it's really about. Notice I still have a layer of flash for my persistence. I'm not there to replace flash, I'm there to complement it. So think of persistent memory as the fastest tier of storage available on the host server. What Aravindan and I are gonna do next is we're looking at intersection points uh, where we can work together and use persistent memory on the host while also using storage as uh, the primary storage and, and actually uh, talking about that not only as separate items, but actually doing some combined testing and looking at solution intersection points. Uh, to continue the shameless plug, you won't only hear from Aravindan and I, we also have Richard Bruner. He's the uh, VMware 
chief platform architect. He's going to be in the session tomorrow talking about what VMware is going to be doing with persistent memory. So if you get a chance, uh, session number is B12666. Uh, it's 9 a.m. and again, you, uh, not only will you get to hear from Aravindan and I, but you'll hear directly from the VMware Chief Platform Architect, uh, Richard Bruner. So can we talk a little bit about object storage and can we talk a little bit about object and cloud storage, what the strategy is around that? I know you guys have a deep partnership with Scalarity. So can you talk about where uh, HPE products, portfolio uh, end off and, and ecosystem partners like Scalarity pick up? Yeah, so um, a couple of things on, on that relationship. Uh, we have um, a couple aspects of the Scalarity relationship. One of them is uh, an investment in Scality, right? So we have skin in the game, right? To making that successful, both companies together. Um, we also have a go-to-market um, uh, relationship, and we uh, have a pretty deep engineering uh, relationship right now. You can actually see some of the work we're doing for uh, appliancizing Scality on HPE platform. So um, we essentially uh, provide a headless uh, API-driven platform layer uh, on a number of our server platforms, uh, specifically in this case Apollo. So you can um, essentially provide an intelligent layer from you know the hardware abstraction layer up to Scality, so they can take all that information that we produce um, for what we call platform management layer, and then build that into that solution, right? So that if they're going to essentially be the solution provider by aggregating you know, hundreds if not thousands of nodes in an object storage cluster. Um, they can take all that information from you know, status of NIC cards and memory and power supplies and you know, a lot of things that aren't super sexy but you know, customers are concerned about that from a server's ability standpoint. Um, they're building that into the UI and we're demoing that right now um, over on the show floor in the transformation zone. So that's one area where we're engineering the product together, and uh, that business is ramping. Uh, actually, as an as a a storage capacity driven server platform, both the Apollo 4200 and 4500 have been um, growing considerably in a number of different areas and use cases, specifically around object storage, so Scality, and then some of the open source around Ceph um, specifically, and then for a number of um, analytics workloads. So we have you know customers coming in every day with multi-million dollar orders of Apollo 4 to 200 and 4500 for Hadoop and a number of different distributions. So from an object storage uh, where you know, we see discrete um, customer implementations for specifically that says, you know, hey, I'm going to have a RFP around object storage. The other area is around a bunch of the solutioning because at the end of the day, object storage is a how, it's not a what, you know, in a lot of cases. Um, so being able to fit that into, you know, an existing workload or solution is something that we offer. So uh, we'll talk a little bit later around store one's cloud bank, but what we're seeing is object storage is a replacement tier for tape in some cases or um, certainly an archive tier. And you know, so we're providing uh, a solution for customers to offload snapshot data and sort of dark data on primary storage to store once and then to Scality and object storage, right, as, a, as its final resting place um, or off into the cloud, you know, for example. So we've got a lot of things going on from Scality from an object storage perspective, not only just bringing the platforms together uh, in terms of software and hardware and that relationship, but then putting it into a larger solution ecosystem context for customers. So they don't just come to us and say, I need two petabytes of object storage. They say, you know, I need a sync and share solution for 5,000 users at 20 gig, you know, a user, uh, for example, you know, or I need something that's going to give me, a, you know, a scalable archive tier for, you know, re uh, retention of my long-term backup data. So there's a bunch of stuff going on with that. It's been pretty successful. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah. Then switching back to the persistent memory conversation, quick question about the ecosystem around persistent memory and in-memory uh, software vendors, where, where are you guys at in maturity in developing solutions and partnerships with your persistent memory hardware platform and certification with players like SAP HANA? Great question, by the way, and that's uh, one of the areas that we talk about often is not just the hardware, right? I, you know, I'm 
can talk about the hardware all day. It's the hardware and software ecosystem. So I would characterize uh, probably our strongest partner to date uh, from the application side has been Microsoft. Uh, the evidence of that is take a look at SQL 2016. Uh, they actually changed the transaction log, uh, the portion of the log where the writes are coming in. They changed that code to expose it as byte addressable or load store access. Uh, we have other uh, engagements going as well. We have a white paper out there today. We worked with Enterprise DB, Postgres Advanced Server. Uh, we have, we've been doing some work with them. We've had engagements with companies like SAP HANA. Uh, because this is a multi-year uh, type of engagement, right? And so we've been working with these software vendors uh, and continue to roll out uh, the, the different technology papers to kind of, you know, not only customers are still kind of grasping how to use this stuff. Is it memory? Is it storage? Where are my bottlenecks? How do I know what to use when? So what we really focus in on is uh, being able to give them not only the use cases, but the technology white papers to back up um, how to implement that. So um, I'd say we still have a ways to go, but we're, we have active engagements going on, both on the operating system side, as well as the application side. And so stay tuned for more rollout of that information. Does that help? Yeah, so, and then, again, I probably won't attend a 666 se session because- Yeah, that could a, be bad luck, right? Yeah, that, that could be bad luck and I'm, that just could be bad luck. But <laughs> talking through uh, the architecture for what you guys are using for that flash layer now, is that independent of the, uh, the memory type, so 3D cross point, et cetera, et cetera? Is that, uh, uh, the, is that flash technology independent today? And so you can switch that out at some point in the architecture? Yeah, so uh, specifically on the implementation of scalable persistent memory, it's a dedicated flash tier for backup. In fact, it won't even be exposed uh, to the operating system, right, because uh, we have it dedicated to that. To the larger question, um, where does everything fit, right? NVDEMs we launched in Gen 9. We're also announcing a new NVDEM, a 16 gig NVDEM in this uh, next generation of Gen 10. We've really tried to hone in on the use cases and, and talk about, you know, capacity points and database uh, write storage bottlenecks. We have a nice uh, use case too where we use NVDEMs with a reduced uh, server core count to reduce the overall database licensing. So like we took a 32 core system with hard drives and did a 16 core system with NVDEMs and actually showed better IO performance. And so when you reduce your core count, you're able to get, uh, you know, reduced your licensing uh, burden with many of the database. Uh, so, you know, 3D Crosspoint, certainly uh, that technology, we're working with Intel on that. So what you're gonna start seeing rolling out uh, in this next generation, we've got NVDIMs, we've got this terabyte scale persistent memory. Both of those run at DRAM speeds. Uh, both of them serve uh, different markets better. The example I'll use with the uh, uh, SQL, uh, that's very low, um, small gigabyte amount. Throwing larger capacity persistent memory is not going to solve the problem better. So NVDIMs will have a place. Scalable persistent memory has a, a place as a multi, um, you know, all the way up the DRAM speed, right? And then Intel 3D Crosspoint, when that rolls out, you'll see uh, additional use cases emerge in kind of that whole portfolio uh, addressing each uh, unique uh, use case. So. I don't know if we talked about it when I stepped out, but NVMe, Fabric, you guys have a roadmap for that at all? Um, is that about NVMe, Fabric? Yeah. Okay, um, sure. I mean, so it, this is an interesting um, time right now, right? So we got all these new things coming up, uh, especially NVMe on the SCSI side. Um, the way we look at it, um, the reason we are doing um, cross-point uh, obtain devices with NVMe now is we believe, you know, as a protocol, you get the best uh, bang for the buck when you couple with a with a de with device like cross-point, the response times are significantly different from standard NAND, right? Uh, next step that we'll see, we're gonna see is um, in the adoption of this is going to be fabric in the back end. Now, to be, uh, to be fair, people have been doing fabric in the front end for a while now. There's been these very small niche players out there technically even DSSD to an extent, something like that. But they've been so targeted, not general purpose at all. Um, but the backend is a much better uh, you know, place for fabric to turn up. So our sort of viewpoint on this is we first do a caching mechanism. 
we progress from that to a back-end adoption and then Fabric coming there. Uh, and then widespread front-end adoption, like a host to uh, target connection uh, in, a, in a block device, that we think is probably the one that will mature the last. I mean, simple thing, I think you hit the nail on the head with the ecosystem question. For this to succeed, um, the apps, more than the apps, the OS vendors have to come on board big time, right? So the ecosystem is, we're just coming up to speed on that. Um, everybody's just waking up to the possibilities here. All uh, right, so this is, this is definitely a multi-year, three to five year window where we'll actually see this come to fruition with the front end fabric being the last of that. And that's the way at least we see the world right now. Three par. So talking about and I'll just keep asking random questions until somebody jumps in or uh, the, the mic is taken. Anybody have any questions? Okay. You get one more and then we're going to pass it this way. Okay. So, uh, so look, question about bottlenecks today and optimizations. The, this is just something I've been curious about since I've been studying out NVM, NVMe fabric and the need to optimize that block layer in the OS that you mentioned. Are you guys running into bottlenecks today, practical bottlenecks in, when it, in all the abstractions that we have within the OS from the virtualization layer all the way down to the actual uh, uh, kernel in your existing hardware platforms that there, there's the need for a larger investment by the OS vendors? I mean, that's a, you know, that's a broader OS question. Um, I, I think um, even before, uh, so one of the reasons why NVMe came up is, is specifically that, right? So when you have these super dense drives, um, I mean, I guess even stepping even further back, uh, we, we were in a world full of custom PCI cards basically five, six years ago. That, that, that was a thing, right? Um, this is the first way to standardize that access. And that in of itself has now opened up, you know, um, you know some, um, some level of uh, optimization that you still need to do within the operating system itself, I'd say, generally. Now, storage perspective, right? Yeah, we, um, NVMe, technically, if, you know, if it works as well as it uh, is supposed to be, it'll really open up a lot more, you know, you're all, basically working at line speed at that point of time. So it's a question of how much you can ingest and handle on the hardware design. Right. The same thing is going to be faced by by the by the um, by the OS, by the OSs on a general purpose platform as well as far as I can I can think about. Now specifically, what those are is something, you know, I I really can't think of right now. But yeah, I mean, so it's it's definitely going to be driven um, by application adoption, right? So if you're going to move from like what you mentioned before, from block addressable to byte addressable, that's a lot of work that needs to be done in most of the modern, you know, Linux kernels and certainly, you know, databases, right? So you've seen just a one portion of SQL that's going to enable that, and that's a lot of work. And then on the other hand, I mean, when we put together a platform like 3PAR, for example, there's significant engineering resources that go into doing things like drivers and kernel level you know, optimizations. And if you have to, if you're going to have a fun front end NVMe fabric that's going to be, you know, point to point, you need to have that level of support for drivers and, and everything that goes on the operating system, as well as with the fabric vendors, right? So, um, you know, that's not going to happen overnight. So that's adoption and it'll be some critical, super critical performance latent. Um, you know, we're, we see when we talk to some of our vendors like Intel and some of the other NVMe folks, I mean, you're essentially using that stuff for very specific um, server side database acceleration um, where you don't need persistent storage and you certainly don't need shared persistent storage yet. So those are very niche applications right now, but as they start to mature and the ecosystem gets there, then you have to bring everyone else in with you, right? That's along that IO path. And it's just take, it's gonna take some time. So I'm gonna take the discussion back in the opposite direction from large enterprise and high performance down to very small business. Uh, in background, I'm both a pre-sales and post-sales engineer for Avar that deals with a ton of very small businesses, which as you might guess means we sell a lot of MSAs. Well, I also deploy them and some of the questions I get is, why does it say dot hill? So this is a twofold question. The first one is, I love that we're getting newer, better MSAs, but they still have kind of a performance max that most of our small clients don't get that that's what they're going to be limited by. Where does Dot Hill end and HPE take off when a new product comes out? 
Second to that is if there's not a lot of additional engineering that HP is bringing in, that it's more of the support and reliability that you guys stand behind these things, when can we see that sunset and have more of HPE owned and architected and engineered from the ground up at that low price point instead of relying on somebody else to do whatever is enough that that's what the initi or the targets identify themselves as so that I can have a three par or a nimble that I can put into these places and that way they know from soup to nuts they're getting an HPE product. So um, I guess I just counter that real quick with they are getting an HPE product, right? Um, at, at the end of the day, right? So it's, it's something that we, um, you know, we have OEM and manufacturing partners in all sorts of areas of the stack, right? Um, you know, we work with, certainly we work with vendors that provide, you know, components of, um, portions of components for, for the MSA solution. We just came out with MSA version five. Um, and it's got a lot of new capabilities, right? You can put SSDs in it. It's got some enhanced uh, data services support. The performance is, you know, 2x what it was before the the last um, version. It hits a certainly a price point for your customers, right? So five grand, seventy five hundred dollars for for that entry. And for a lot of folks, that's a um, it's a sales motion that's very tightly coupled with compute, right? So you sell couple servers, DL380s, DL360s, and combined with MSA. And, you know, frankly, when we did the press release last week, I mean, a, a lot of our channel partners and folks that cover the channel, they probably get just as much, um, you know, click-throughs and interest on the MSA announcement as they do for all the rest of the stuff that we have up on the board, right? Um, so the fact that MSA has been in the portfolio for, you know, well over 10 years at this point, um, we sell a lot of it, and we have a lot of customers out there. And from a quality perspective, the quality is really good. Um, we don't have, um, you know, from an annual outage event rate perspective, it's very, very low for customers. Um, they get a very good experience, and you know, we try to make it as much of an HPE branded product and, and, and experience as we can with plugins and management plugins. So, for us, we have had a long-standing engineering, you know, partnership with some of the folks that provide those those components. And you know, we've talked to our MSA customers; they're pretty happy with it. Um, so that's why we just released the fifth generation of it. Um, I think when you take a look at some architectures like three par and nimble bringing them down um, to that capacity point and certainly that price point um, is something that we'll continue to look at you know at, at the end of the day but when we have those customers they're looking for to hit a certain very, you know pretty low and aggressive price point with not a lot of data services but they want sort of rock solid uh, quality and they want you know, good enough performance. And if we're going to be investing in other areas, like for example, you know, talking about NVMe for three par and scale, and we're talking about predictive analytics and the ecosystem for Nimble, um, different customer profile. So horses for courses, you know, and and, and I, we have a lot of happy MSA customers. I don't, I don't think that's going to go we, away. We have a lot of very happy MSA customers until they hit, you know, I, w I want champagne for my ginger ale budget and we have a very hard time talking them back down that this is what you can afford, we're doing the best we can. It's a great product, but I would love to see some of the higher end features that we get in the three par and nimble affordable for that same. Yeah, I, th I think you'll see that over time. I mean, it, if you took a look at five years ago, right, HPE was super successful at bringing a lot of the high end features from high end storage into the mid range and that, definitely absolutely fueled the success of the 7000 series adoption, 7450, the 8000, and the 8450. And similarly, you'll start to see that type of, you know, availability for lower end products, you know, that are in that price band two, price band three world. Um, certainly people will adopt flash in that world as well too, um, because they'll start to hit those price points. Um, and you'll start to see those data services and price points translate to hyperconverge as well, right? Because those customers that are buying DL380s and MSA, um, maybe they'll continue to do that. Maybe they'll be looking for a simple experience that drives that whole stack together with a, an offering like SimpliVity, right? Sort of a natural progression for some of those customers. Okay, we probably have time for one more if somebody's got one last question. How about you guys have seen NetApp's new hyper-converged announcement and how they're going to be HCI, but with non-shared cores. 
any thoughts of leveraging Store Virtual and Apollo to do an equivalent for independent scale between storage and compute? I guess we're getting into a HCI taxonomy debate, I guess, which I don't would love to avoid. Well, um, and, and out the front, I, I'm one of the people that believes the definition is shared core, that if you're not doing storage and compute based on the same CPU, it's not really HCI. But apparently Gartner says it's okay if you're doing it in the same 2U container, regardless of how you're sharing or not sharing. So. I guess. Um, so, you know, for, from my perspective for, for HCI, um, we have customers that are going to self-select into that, right? They're looking for, you know, whether it's because of a buying pattern, you know, if, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm strapped for OpEx and all I have is a generalist IT admin or someone who's really focused on hypervisors, right? Um, and we're going to go pitch, we're going to go and push SimpliVity, right? That's our, that is our solution for hyperconverged infrastructure. And it's a very good solution, and it solves a lot of customer problems in terms of simplifying the storage stack, built-in data protection, all of the provisioning um, that we're adding on top of it um, that we've had in our you know previous hyperconverged platforms. So, from my perspective, that is a customer that wants that simplicity, right? Um, and they're going to go and choose that that type of platform. On the other hand, we can provide a pretty good stack in a very simple. Um, uh, user experience, right? So if you take a look at, for example, take a look at Nimble, right? With you have VM Vision, right? Predictive Analytics. Now we're we're going to be certifying that in a converged infrastructure package. So you've got Synergy, networking, and Nimble storage all provided to you, where you essentially get independent scale of CPU, memory, bandwidth, networking, and external storage but with the simplicity of being able to map all that from the application through the hypervisor all the way down to the storage, right? Um, maybe it's not you know, as simple as a hyperconverged system, but it's pretty good from a, from a management perspective. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm not an expert on what NetApp has provided, but I know from a fact that from our portfolio, we have you know, thousands of HCI customers. They just released a platform, and I wish them the best of luck. I think you're basically talking about the announcement they did yesterday, right? Yes. We were kind of busy here, so I don't imagine t people know too much about what NetApp did yesterday, but... <laughs> I, I was assuming that you pay a lot of attention to the competitive aspects, irrespective of how busy you get, because competition. Yeah. Yeah, there's only so many hours in the day, though, but I hope you appreciate You know, we were out at Top Golf last night, so I wasn't reading about NetApp. I don't know what these guys were doing, but... Um, and Becca informed me... As long as you guys can stay, we actually had the time until six, and I'm not going to keep you here till six. If you don't have questions, you have time for your question, and if anybody else has another question, we we can take another question after this. Thank you. So right now, HP has a lot of storage solutions right now, and each storage solution is for a very a very specific task, very specific application. Now that Nimble and Simplify is part of HP. Should we, should we be expecting some kind of hybrid solution or each technology is going to be evolving on its own way? So let me answer that from a nimble perspective. And, and we've, as you can imagine, had many, many discussions now because when you think about how you, when you have a portfolio and how you position them, there is clearly overlap. I mean, nimble spans from fairly modest capacity points all the way up into multi-petabytes, as does 3 par. So, so in that dimension, there's, there's overlap. But I think what's really interesting, and when you look at it, and I can say this from a nimble perspective and now putting on my HPE hat, is both products actually um, really tempt a different kind of buyer. So if you think about the kind of buyer that typically will go for 3 par, it tends to be very data center centric, caring about massive amounts of flexibility, synchronous replication, maybe mixing fiber channel and iSCSI on the same federated cluster, unified block and file. So there's, there's kind of this set of criteria that certain types of customers always congregate towards and they want to be able to tweak every sort of piece of functionality and control where the data goes. 
Nimble's approach is really the polar opposite. We've sent our design center is around simplicity and predictive analytics. And it typically suits a buyer that looks maybe more VM centric, much more generalist than specialist, you know, storage. They don't want to manage the storage as a separate device. They want storage to be almost autonomously managed. They trust that we can very efficiently lay out the data so you don't make RAID choices and tiering choices. It's all handled for you. So we see them as very different kinds of customers. And we know from a nimble perspective, when we look at when we win against all the competition, it's because those attributes rise to the surface. We've lost many deals to 3PAR where the customer valued much more of that flexibility and that continues to serve that kind of customer. So I think you know, there is a massive innovation engine and a number of people working on both platforms and um, they, they'll continue to do that. I think we just address very different kinds of buyers. Now, as we said earlier, there's lots of synergy that we'll leverage from each other, particularly around the, the management and the predictive analytics. And it's a great thing. Last night, we spoke to a customer that has MSA, Nimble, and 3PAR. They're used in three different parts of their organization, all managed under the same IT team. They're all you know, adding capacity to each of the three. And we, we see that as a, as a very common sort of thing.